treat everybody right. Get rid of all this animosity that leads to bloodshed and all the rest of that. And if you agree with me, let me hear you say, yes, we all agree. That we're going to treat everybody right.
How many of you can testify to the faithfulness of God? And through all of the challenges you face in your life, your family, your job, even in our country, that God has truly been faithful. Amen. We're going to have our brother Van Fowl to come and minister to us in song and remind us of how faithful God has been to us. This song that he's going to sing is dedicated to all church leaders throughout the Bahamas, particularly those who are semi-retired or have recently retired from full-time ministry. In particular, Dr. Ed Allen, Dr. Charles Saunders, and Bishop Simeon Hall. We encourage you to remain faithful as our Lord is faithful. Brother Van Father.
thank you very much, Brother Ryan Fowler. We want to say thank you to our audience joining us by way of television. You've tuned in, you've tuned in to the second in a series of services designed by Grace Community Church. They've been designed in honor of our nation's 40th anniversary and um, the titled Maintaining an Abiding Respect for Christian Values. We've chosen as our speaker to lead these services, Dr. Rex Major, Senior Pastor Emeritus here at the church. This second series today it will address the issue of when not to feed the hungry. And we encourage you and thank you for tuning in and encourage you to listen to the following Sundays, the service is entitled, Is Money Our New Idol? And for the final Sunday, Capital Punishment, Vengeance or Justice? Thank you for tuning in and we pray that God will bless you. We have a few other, just one other item we'd like to remind you of. You will have heard of the promotions regarding our marriage is honorable service. It was initially designed for June 30th. Today we want to advise you that that service has been scheduled for August 25th, 6 p.m. in Rawson Square. We will host a very special service in honor of our 40th anniversary, where we will all we will honor couples who were married in 1973, the same year of our year of independence. The ceremony is called Help for the Family, Marriage is Honorable. If you know of any couples married in 1973, we ask you to encourage them to let us know so that they can be honored during this special time. You can contact the church at 394-7223 and we would be happy to receive that information. Thank you for joining us. At this point, we're going to turn our focus to our short-term missions commissioning service, commissioning time. We have a team of persons who have commissioned being commissioned to go off to serve the Lord and as a missionaries and we want to honor them and commission them to the Lord today. Here at Grace we do our best to take global missions very serious because we understand that it is the heart beat of our Lord that others come to know Him. As part of our missions ministry, our short term missions teams where persons go into the mission field for a year or less. Over the years, our youth have been to Puerto Rico, Brazil, Peru, Guatemala, Thailand. From September 2012 to August of this year, we will have and have had some of our youth go on short-term missions to Mexico, Honduras, and as mentioned earlier, or we want to mention, Beijing Rogers and Autumn Dickens returned this week, returned from a month mission in Nepal. And then in August, we have one of our youth, Nikki McCarty, going off to South Korea for a month. We want to just have our moments of commissioning of this team as they prepare to go to Haiti later this month, or in a week's time. Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody this morning? I'm waiting on my partner. Good morning. Hello, everybody. My name is Tina Kelly Chow and I will be one of the assistant team leaders for this wonderful team. I have been a member of this going team for the past 20 years. Hi. Hi, my name is Beijing Rogers, and I have been going on mission trips since the age of three years and five months. That was about 15 years ago. I will be directing this year's Vacation Bible School. Missions Ministry will this year celebrate 24 years of sending teens in the missions field and this year is our 29th year of the team that, sorry, and this year our team is, is a 29th team that Grace would have sent on a missions trip. Over the years we have been to St. Martin and the Grenadines and the Dominican Republic numerous of times. St. Martin, Grenada, Nigeria, and North Carolina each once. And the majority of the years, we have ministered to numerous villages in Haiti. 
Here at home, we went to Grand Bahama and Inagua to assist with rebuilding after they experienced hurricanes, and to Luthra to assist with the building of Camp Bahamas. Our teams over the years have assisted with the building of schools, churches, dormitories, and clinics, conducting medical and eye clinics, and of course, Vacation Bible School for the Children. This year, we will be going to Lacoma, Haiti, a village seven hours up northwest of Port-au-Prince. We have a team of 26 persons that comprise of a mixture of children, teens, women, and men. Behind me in our yellow shirts, we have our senior pastor of this great church, Pastor Lyle Bethel. We also have an elder of our church, Elder Andy Knowles, a mother and son team of Carol and Jeremy Mishevich, sisters Beijing and Bajra Rogers, brothers Brandon and Jaden Kemp, a brother and sister team of Tarek and Raven Kelly, Mr. Brian Russell, Andre Major Jr., Kaya Roll, Shanae Wilson, Chadero Seeley, Sian Fowler, Ayanna Bethel, Jerry Moore, David Hanna, Ashley Adley, and our teen's nurse, who is a local Bahamian nurse here, but she's visiting her family just ahead of the team, and her name is Judy Ducatel. And then, all, none but least, our team leader, Miss Jewel Major. In Lacoma, we will assist with putting a roof on a church and some other small construction work needed conduct vacation Bible school, and host a medical clinic. We ask for your prayers as we take this journey, um, being obedient to what our Lord has asked. Uh, we've gotten a request from the people that there is a need for children's clothing, so if you are able to assist boys and girls ages 5 to 12, you can drop the clothing off to the church, and you'll be grateful for that. We also ask to remind the team that this week Thursday is our send-off dinner and it will be here at the church. In attendance will be a foreign affairs representative, the Haitian Embassy, and so we ask you your prayers. But before we end, we'd like to say that Grace Community Church sponsors globally a lot of people that feel the call of God. And we are honored today that we have one of the persons that we sponsor, Mr. Dan Seymour, who is a missionary to Asia. <laughs> years ago that said some can give, some can go, and some can pray. You, we ask, pray and ask God to show you whether you're the praying, the giving, or the going person. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have a prayer for the team before we leave. We're going to ask everybody just maybe come up a little bit as we pray. All right, let's pray together. Father, we know this day that this team here, that you have raised up, that you put together, we know, Lord, that you don't make mistakes and you don't act by chance or luck, but you're sovereign and you've prepared each heart um, that you see standing before you today because you have a mission for us in Haiti. Lord, I ask three things as we leave as a team. First, Lord, I ask that you will Give us your mercy, give us your protection, give us our traveling mercies as we go by air, on the road, a lot of traveling to do. We pray, Lord, that your angels will watch over us, that you will uh, help us to be strong and stand against the evil one and any things that he might throw at us. Give us uh, health, maybe not be run down, maybe work together as a team, keep each person healthy. And uh, maybe put on the full armor, Lord, that uh, you've given us so that we might fight the devil and that we might have a great impact in the country of Haiti. Secondly, Lord, I ask that you would do a work in our hearts. Father, I know a lot of time mission trips are not so much about the country we go to, but the people who are going to that country. And I really feel, Lord, that you have a, a work to do in each of our hearts. May you help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. May we be like Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch, Lord. May we be 
open to what you're saying and ready to listen. May you uh, give us an open heart. May you have each one of us to be ready to share the gospel, to know how to share it, and be prepared uh, to tell people about Jesus. Be able to tell people that the good news is that you died for our sins and that you were buried, and three days later you rose again, that we might know you. Father, give us uh, an open door to do that. Yeah, the third thing, Lord, I pray that uh, you would help us have a great impact in the country that we're going to. Pray that you'll give us receptive hearts. May people be open to hear the gospel. May they be open to receive it. May they come into a new relationship with you as a result of us being there. And uh, may you help us to um, meet new friends, get to know them, get to be friends with them, be able to pray with them, and most of all, Lord, to be able to tell them about Jesus. So we ask that you give us, give us uh, an open heart feel, Lord, that might be responsive to you. Go with us now. We thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you for your protection. And we thank you to be going in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Give this team a hand as they prepare to leave. Early Saturday morning, they'll be on the plane on the way to the mission field. And they go with our prayers that God will keep them safe and they will achieve the goal. Amen? Amen. We now turn our time to worship through giving. We believe that all that we have belongs to the Lord and He's asked us to give a portion back. So I invite you as an audience to stand as we recite our offering covenant. It's printed in the bulletin for those of you visiting. Shall we recite together? Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your substance, and your bonds will be filled to overflowing, and your hearts will brim over with new wine. Care for them will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Let's give thanks to God. Father, we thank you for all your many blessings to us as individuals, as families, and as a nation. You provided for every single need, and we say thank you. And Lord, we recognize and we worship you through giving, and you've asked us to give a portion, and we want to do so cheerfully, willingly, and we want you to be honored by our giving today. Thank you. Bless the offering in Jesus' name. Amen. We're privileged to have our choir to come and minister to us in song at this point. The choir is directed by Avery Lightborn, Imana Fonseca, and today it is being directed by Miss Christy Colley. Their song is being dedicated to those who serve our country through in times of crisis. Particularly, we want to highlight the social outreach of um, privileges and ministries in the country, service organizations, and health organizations. Welcome, Just Grace.
just grace. Lord, I tell you, many times you are behind the floor. You are just grace. That's what it's about Jesus. We glorify him any day of the week. Amen? Amen. We now turn our focus to our patriotic moments. And this, these are moments that we've been doing for years. Every summer, when we have our National Focus Months like we are doing now, we take time to recognize the contributions made toward the national development of the Bahamas. Today we have a segment that we want you to pay close attention as you participate in this segment. And to last, last week, we were privileged to recognize the contribution of Mr. Timothy Gibson, the author and composer of our national anthem. And I'm sure that each time we sing that national anthem, till the road you trod lead it to your God, will mean more to all of us as we recognize what valuable contributions you made. Today we begin with Reflections on Independence 1973, and we invite Dr. Major to share those moments for us. Circle, 
an offer of prayer for the country and for the flag as it was hoisted for the very first time. That includes my official participation in things related to the independence of 1973. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Major. Of course, we've invited six of the young children here at Grace to come and share with us the prayer that was offered by Dr. Major back in 1973 on the occasion of the first National Ecumenical Service. I want to invite Denise Roy, a student from Nassau Christian Academy, Jerron and Justin Fowler, students of Carlton Francis Primary, Anna Wallace from Genesis Academy, and Tajay Kalma from Temple Christian Academy to come and share this prayer.
that we have to meet you face to face and give account to you for all we have done or left undone. To this end, dear God, bring us to knowledge of salvation through you, your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. I think we can say a hearty amen to that. Even though God was offered 40 years ago, we still offer that same prayer to God today on behalf of our country. And I hope that it was refreshing for you. I want to invite you to stand. We're participating in these patriotic moments as we sing God Bless Our Sunny Climb, a song written by Dr. Philip Raleigh. We will sing two verses. We have the scripture, responsive scripture reading, and then we will sing the final two verses. Pastors and teachers 
to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Amen. Paul is writing to a church in the city of Thessalonica some years ago. A new church that he himself brought into being uh, during his visit there with the preaching of the gospel. And it reads as follows with respect to the passage I need in my presentation. But just before I start the reading, 
may I be privileged to reiterate the welcome given especially to the Lan family. Very pleased to have all of you Lan family. Some years ago people thought I was a Lan. When I went to GHS and had a good friend named Leslie. And Charles. And outside there was a chap named Tex. We were all knew each other very well. And now the reading. Second, Thessalonians, chapter 3, beginning with 6. Dr. Rami, listen carefully. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. Seven. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, says Paul. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we work night and day, laboring and toiling. <clears throat> so that we would not be a burden to any of you. It's called independent. We did this, not because we do not have the right to such help. In other words, we had the right to demand you pay us, but we gave it up for a reason. But in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow, it, it was show and tell. For even when we were with you in our first visit, in our early visit, we gave you this rule, this principle, this regulation, this directive. If a man, read this with me now, it's on the screen? Yeah. Let's read that whole piece again at the beginning. If, everybody now, read well. If a man do not work, he shall one more time. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We here, says Paul, we here that some among you are idle. Even at that time they had the punch magazine. <laughs> they are not busy filling the next week. See the difference? You can be busy or up in other people's affairs. Such people, all is still writing to the same crew, such people such people we command not suggest, not recommend, not propose. If you, says Paul, put me in the position of leadership, this is a command from leader to follow. From apostle to disciple. We command and urge What does your version say? In the name of the community. In the name of the economy. Social workers. You see, we have lost the fact 
that Jesus Christ is above them all. Amen. That, to, that they should settle down. It's a, it's some order, not chaos. Some discipline. Remember what our preamble says of commitment to? Self discipline. That was the first one listed. Self discipline. First one listed. Settle down and earn the bread they eat. Earn the bread they eat. Now you know I could preach for a week here, yeah? This is some sermons. This is a whole lot of sermons. That Pastor Wilfred? Yes. By the way, you'll be my chief amen man, right? Okay. I, I pay well. <clears throat> and as for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. Oh, my Father. Oh, my. That, that's Christian. That's what Christians do. What is right? After all, the word right is the first part of the word righteousness. And we brag about the fact that righteousness exalts a nation. Well, if righteousness exalts a nation, you have to do right for the righteousness to happen. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, Christian discipleship program is not a free for all. It's not if I choose to cooperate. It's not that ain't for me. If anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, take special note of them. Put them in a special file. Do not associate with them. Alienate yourself. Because they're breaking down this whole thing we're trying to build. They are betrayers to the cause. In order that he might feel I wish we could get some more people to change. So they break down. So they give up. So they change. So they turn. Yet, because we are Christians, do not regard him as an enemy. But warn him. Beautiful, isn't it? I mean, the Christian message is clear. The writings are there for us all. No behavior should be in ignorance. We have Bibles everywhere. Yeah. When last have you took time to read it? Contact. Yeah. It's like having the direction on how to run the machine. And the machine is breaking down and you wouldn't turn to the direction. Hold hands with somebody. Oh, Father, we're here in the presence to be directed by you and to be helped by you. Holy Spirit, you are the great helper in bringing us in line with your ideas. Please now, touch each of us, really. May no one escape the truthfulness and the significance of these words. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to give you a summary and then go into some thoughts. First of all, that is not the only word that the Apostle Paul says about treating people. The same Paul would say, look after the poor. Same Paul. In fact, he said it himself. I work hard to make money, not only to pay my bills, 
but that I would have something to give to the poor. So Paul is not including every single human being in that umbrella. He knows that there are categories of persons who must receive our handouts. That's the only way they can survive. But he is focusing on persons who should not come under that umbrella. They should be denied the privilege of welfare. Got it? So don't, don't misunderstand Paul. He, he, that's not all he said, but he's, a, he's going after his wing, main problem. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to some thoughts I have here about uh, work and so on. This is not a solution for employment. This is not a way to find a new job, nothing like that. We, we're just trying to show that to be a disciplined person, there's a time when you've got to find. Work. One of the reasons that the people adopted the attitude that they did was that they had a false idea that Jesus was soon coming. Now Paul taught that. In fact, the first letter is filled with that teaching from beginning to an end that Jesus Christ will soon return. Now when they interpreted that teaching, they begin to feel with it, Jesus is soon coming. What's the use? Well, I put a seed in the ground because before it springs, what? So, relax. It's a pity how we could abuse biblical teachings to suit some of our narrow, selfish interpretations. Paul never meant to release them from any normal human duty by teaching them that Christ will be returning. The coming of Christ again does not diminish any human duty on earth in any measure. Don't use that to confuse your responsibility. If Christ is going to come tomorrow morning, and you knew it, Whatever you are duty bound to do between now and tomorrow should still be done. It is not an escape from what is vitally important to human existence. Jesus is not coming back or a teaching of his coming back is not a relief from your human duties. In fact, if you read it carefully, it calls you to an escalation of those duties. Do them better. Do them right. Because his coming will also be a moment when your works will be judged. So they use that understanding wrongly. The church's message through the Bible is that there is an explanation for work. The Bible makes it clear that work is the heritage of humans. If you are a human, you don't work. In the first place then, the church provides an explanation for the need of work. And that's what I will do in the next couple of minutes. The Bible makes it clear that work is the heritage of humans. It's not, as many people say and say too often, that it is the fruit of our sin. I'll show you that that's not true. What sin brought was that work would become a little more difficult to do. You will get more opposition when you try to do it. Things will get in your way as you try to do it. But it doesn't in any measure diminish the fact that it must be done. Are you with me? Mr. Adley, where's that amen? <laughs> you see, sin brought a judgment on man's involvement with work, not that work itself was judged. Work was not the judgment. The judgment was that man himself will have a tough time getting the work done now that sin has come. It would have been easier to do the same thing had there not been sin. 
Some of you have moved your mouth yet. <laughs> I, I need some agreements on this. Well said, Rex. Well said. Okay. The Bible gives repeated emphasis that God is the creator, the preserver and the sustainer and the owner. And moment by moment, he is the chief actor in the day-by-day -day affairs of the total universe. You've got to get used to that. The universe is God-ordered and God-controlled. No political man or entity or policy runs this show. No matter what the name. Nebuchadnezzar found that out. He thought the whole earth was under his domain. God says, I'll teach you the truth. Specifically, the Bible bears witness that the earth is the Lord's and everything relating to it. The Bible affirms very boldly that the sea is his. And we Bahamians better get used to that. We are talking about pumping oil on the ground. We better be sure we won't mess up God's sea by doing so. The sea is his. It goes on to describe how God has set the moon up in the, in the sky in such a way that it exerts dominion in some way on the earth. And of course, during the daytime, the sun rules. God designed the day and the night as essential, diff different operation theaters, but still it's his design. With all of this background then, the human creature was designed by God to be suited to live within the environment that God had pre-created for him. The man who we, who we bring forth was fitted to what God had already outfitted before he came. You understand that? Now that's, that's a study in itself, but no time. Just bear in mind, God set every single thing in place before he brought the acme of his creation, the human being. Everything was in place. Nothing came out except, I don't know, the rib occasion. The Bible's abundant evidence makes it perfectly clear that because the earth and its environment were made before man was made, the earth was made ready for man's entrance on the scene. Unless this creation preparation was in place, it would have been out of order to bring the man into uh, the operation. All the raw material by which God's human creation would be able to fulfill perfectly what God had in mind was already in place before the man arrived. Every single thing. Adam named animals that were already in full function. Adam didn't give them function. You need any of them. They were functioning well in the independent existence. And all of them mature and complete in every detail for their intended divine purpose. And so Adam himself was so designed by God that he could do more than animals. He's another level now. He could name the animals and have dominion of the animals. He could eat some of them if he wanted to. He is human. He's above it all. He could give them names and allocate them. There was no confusion in God's creation. Everything was in order. Yes, Absolute order. Each individual animal species could be distinguished by itself. There was no uh, mix up between the uh, giraffe and the hippopotamus. <laughs> Separate. All creepy things and feathered creatures and the fish variety all in their proper place. There was divine order. And yet in that completed order and design, God made the man with the capacity to give some form of new shape and direction to that creation. God purposely left the garden in such a prepared state. That it needed the Adam's supervisory activity for it to become what God wanted it to be. 
Are you there? Yeah. Even was a created perfect order. God so had his perfect order created that it needed the man to come and redirect certain elements. Are you with me? And Adam was created with all those qualities that would equip him to be able to take control of the situation and carry out the assignment to till the ground, to guard the environment, and to supervise their operations. It must not be missed. For those of us who are very intellectual and very high-minded and class conscious, it must not be missed that the very first labor contract set in motion by God, the creator, the owner, the chief operator, was one which was manual in nature. Come on, give God a hand. The first need of man's exertion of energy was manual labor. Till the ground. Prune the trees. But notice, when sin came, it toppled it. And everybody now thinks manual labor. Oh my God. <laughs> what have I come to? Go back to the Bible and get your mind cleared up. There was nothing evil because there was no sin yet. When Adam put the first spade in the ground, it, there was no sin anywhere. It was a daytime engagement. Notice, it was an outdoor operation. The sun beat upon him. If you search the record very carefully, you'll also notice something very strange. You'll discover that there is no mention of any promise of remuneration for anything he did. Adam's work for God was not for pay. So the original work detail was not an attempt to earn money or other forms of pay. Work in the very earliest experience of man was mainly a natural outworking of who he was. To be man, he must work. That's his fulfillment of his true nature. Take this knowledge with you. A man I say man generally now, I meaning female as well. A man, woman, who is out of shape according to work, is out of shape. Full stop. You ain't truly human yet until you see work as God shows it to be essential to your well-being. It makes you somebody to work. It's true to your creative order to work. Yeah. It's not a denial of what God wants for you. It's yeah. affirmation. Yeah. It was a part of the whole. His physical makeup, with muscle and movement and capabilities, his mind with intelligence and innovation, as interesting in his being, all directed him to be a doer, yeah. a producer. To create, to dominate, to rule, to shape, to improve, to produce, to do better. Yeah. And Adam has let loose to be himself by the release of his creation. Such he was. He could not be anything else to be truly Adam. He had to go after those trees that was in his makeup. Yeah. No one had to prod him to. Amen. No one had to coach him to. <laughs> This is what I am. 
just as it was natural to him when he had the first sight of Eve. No one said to him, boy, get close. <laughs> no one said to him, go on. No, no. It was natural to him. He actually moved toward this girl and actually said, no! Who must kill a selected target works hard. 
to set up the exact time, the place and the occasion when this heinous job could be done well. Don't you agree? Yeah. Some of us work hard. But such work, despite the amount of brain or brawn that came out of the effort, cannot be the category of work which the gospel of Jesus Christ endorses. Can it? Yeah. No, sir. Brother Wayne, can it? No, sir. Listen carefully now because we're getting some sticky ground. During our infamous commission of inquiry into the transshipment of illegal drugs throughout these Bahama Islands, Strong, verifiable evidence was brought out to show the thousands of Bahamians worked in that evil industry. And they received pay for services rendered. Do you think that's the kind of work Paul is exhorting? Does that, the Thessalonians get involved in? There were people who were taxi drivers truck drivers, boat captains and crew, aircraft pilots and crew, just to name a few. And the report stated especially lawyers and parliamentarians. They all were working. <clears throat> and getting good. Mm. But is that, would we want to hold up as a model for our citizens? Is that the Christian Call, just do anything since it pays you something. But despite the large income so accrued, no sane or sacred person would consider that that type of work would bring honor to God or truly bless men. Now you must bear in mind that there's some things happening now. For instance, smuggling of human persons. Hmm? Catching crawfish out of season. Oh, you sell it, get a big lump, but that's not the kind of work we want, right? Come on, help me now. We don't want workers catching the crawfish out of season, right? Even though it's work, even though you get paid. We don't want them catching crawfish that are undersized either, do we? But it's work. You go down, die the work, dig. You work. And you sold it to somebody who was in complicit with you and you got paid. But is that the work you want? No. The point I'm making now is, as you digest the call to work, you must also interpret what God intends your work image to be like. You know the oldest work in the universe, right? It's called prostitution. Now, we've been very silent on it lately. But it's rampant in the society. And there are some people who own them and collect the big sums. But that's not the kind of work we're asking for or promoting. So let it be made known very early. Not every activity which employs a person and pays even a fair wage for energies expended would get the blessing of the word of God or the people who are submitted to that word. The biblical textual control seems very strongly to say that the work the Bible has reference to is work that is good. That's the work, word most often used. So ethics. Ethics have to be introduced into the work sphere. Yes. You can't avoid it, friends. You, you can't push morality out of life in any category. Right. Right. Don't you let these winds that are blowing so strongly in the Bahamas now say, child, what does it matter? I get my pay, don't I get it? I'm making my money, ain't I getting it? How I make it, how I get it, so what? Morality is essential to a sane, sensible country life. And do not be deceived here. 
Now someone doles out cash very liberally for some charity or charities. From the profits earned from immoral activity. Such charitable transactions do not baptize that activity into goodness. Even today, there are Bohemians who hail with glee the money which they get from drug lords. And even though that money improved their house, improved the roof, gave them a beautiful outside color, got furniture to make them more comfortable, and brought what we say normally is a blessing. Yet, Despite that, despite the fact that the woman could sit on the sofa that she didn't have last week, that whole piece of business was evil. There were those who were angry when the drug lords are captured and charged in court. He is our sugar daddy. that just working and making money cannot be itself the, the procedure that we use. It has to be good, clean money. Yeah. Such a thing as ill-gotten wealth. When you were children in Long Island, we heard this over and over again. Boy, the receiver is just a part of the thief. Over and over. Listen, son. You might not have been there, but if you took it from him, you're just as bad. Yeah. It's called collaboration with evil. Yeah. Let it be known throughout this archipelago that wealth gotten by any evil and illegal means is not good wealth. And God himself in his own way will bring judgment on that kind of operation. Although we are proposing that all able-bodied, sane-minded persons should do everything in his or her power to have a job that pays a decent wage. Yet we must qualify by repeating the job sought after should be one that is morally and socially uplifting to the society. A job an honest God is more than a means for a paycheck. Some years ago, some government structures to have this sign said, no free riders. That's a sign that the Christian methods could easily borrow. No free ride. You do not live and feast on and suck the lifeblood out of anybody else so you can live. Amen. Now we could translate this from the lazy, lousy person to the greedy landlord who doesn't care how the house is or the room is, but you pay this rent. Electricity not working, water not working, pay! I'll talk about that when we do the money one. That's coming up next week. That's going to be a time. Is money our new God? Oh boy. Don't miss it. And pray for me that I will still live after that sermon. How tragic, how tragic is the ugly truth. This seems almost untrue, unbelievable. How tragic is the ugly truth that some men slash husbands slash sweethearts hide around the house waiting for the paycheck of the woman to come in. That 
paycheck maintains the house and all the bills. And after she come and he get a couple of dollars, guess what? He goes out with the boys. How in the how could a robust male? <laughs>
live a vacation like the tourists forever. But my father stood his ground. Get out of there, boy. Here's what he said. I deduced from looking around my environment that the average boy will not move from where he now lives. Very few will get a scholarship to go to the government high school or any of the other high schools in Nassau. But at least he still has property, he has land, he has space. So if he can approve the use of his land and earn some food every week, at least he could live comfortably and independently. Yeah. Yeah. Parents. Do you demand that your children work? No, I don't mean work for money, you know. All types of work doesn't have a wage. They work because they belong to an environment called home. Then they have an obligation to contribute to the welfare of that little community called home. They're a citizen first there before anywhere else.
sometimes if you in a contract with somebody, it's a lie. Cheap. You, you promise nine to five, one hour break. You come back 15 minutes after lunch. I'm going to leave five to five. No, 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 just dishonest. That's ungodly. That's a sin before God. Just as much a sin as the adulterer or the fornicator or the drunkard. That's a sin. And you have to deal with it. Just dishonesty in the heart. That's purpose. Purpose dishonesty. I intend to rob you and cheat you. I want to do it. I'm glad I can do it. I'm getting an edge over on you. Because you're not important, only me. And that's idolatry.
God, made in his image, made for his purpose, and eventually all that you are will be brought under judgment by him. Bring your life now. Save yourself from that tragedy. Come now and get it straight. Repent of yesterday and start afresh. One last time with the song, please. Come now. Maybe deciding who to marry, that's a big question. You're deciding what job to take. You're, you're deciding you know, whether to live here or live someplace else. Serious questions, just come down. We ask God's blessing on you, God's guidance. The last call will be somebody who deep down in your heart, you want to come forward just to say thank you, God. He did something for you recently. He said something to you. Oh man, you gotta, you gotta say thank you, Lord. You wanna say thank you, oh God, thank you. Look what you did. Look at the way you made for me. In the dark, the road was dark, dreary, and I didn't know where to turn. And look what you did for me, Lord. Come. 
come now, you, you'll be saved. So when I do that prayer, those of you who come to give thanks, just wave your hand nice and loud so God will see, angels will see, and all of us will see. By the way, you can have your eyes open for this prayer. You don't have to close your eyes. You can look around and see what people are doing, how they're responding. Oh man, we need some more space. You can come closer to now, all right? Yeah. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, for those who come here to wave hands, that God did something for you. Raise your hand. You can come in to pray. Praise the Lord. Let's have that prayer first. Say it with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you. The way you blessed me. Amen. Those who come for guidance, looking for guidance. For the Lord to guide you. Hands up, please. Guidance. Lord. You are the one who said, I will guide you with mine eye. I will lead you with my hand. Lord, take these now. Give the guidance they need. Amen. 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 Other burdens? Maybe private stuff you don't want to say? Lord, you are a real God. You are alive and well. You love us. You care for us. You hear us. You can help us. Your promise is clear. Call unto me and I will answer you. Seek me and you shall find me. God, answer these needs we pray now in Christ's name. And now the general prayer. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit bring about in our lives this week something new, something fresh. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The service is over. Thank you for coming. See you next week. God bless. Just, just before we, we dismiss, I want you to join with me as we recognize the presence of Mrs. Lilith Adderley.